and welcome to this CodeBuddies.org Hangout. By joining CodeBuddies Hangout, you can ask questions, work through tutorials, share ideas, or pair program on open source projects. Today, we're going to be working on a project that's sort of new to this live stream. Um, it's relating to mobility and promoting sustainable mobility options when people are um, going from point A to point B, uh, how we can inform people of the environmental impact of their mobility, their personal transportation. This is geared towards mobility operators who offer people um, options for getting around, bus, tram, train, bike, taxi, car rental, things like that. You'll offer a portfolio of um, mobility options and people will be able to choose. They won't have to own a car. They can just use a car when needed, but use other modes for their primary mobility needs. So part of this idea is called mobility as a service. And we want to be able to kind of tailor the service to the individual needs. And not everybody um, is concerned with environmental impact of their mobility. But for those who are, we're going to want to offer um, kind of information that allows them to compare the mobility options uh, on an equal ground, sort of uh, some equal basis to the extent possible. Um, because estimating environmental impact and specifically carbon emissions is not a trivial <laughs> um, undertaking. It's, there's a lot of just um, uncertainty and uh, variability. <laughs> Different kinds of vehicles have different fuel economy. There's lack of information of what type of vehicle uh, vehicles people are taking. We barely know where they're coming and going to, uh, coming from and going to, for example. Um, also, yeah, we don't know the occupancy of the vehicles. If a bus is running uh, with no passengers versus a full bus, the per passenger um, CO2 emissions will be lower than it would. Uh, in the latter case. Uh, so anyway, that aside, <laughs> we've been working on a basic model and we published a Python library. You can find this library on GitHub and the Python packaging index. And essentially what we've got is a small Python library to do some calculations based on the European Environmental Agency, EEA, some figures they published uh, uh, a little bit ago, I think 2012 or 2014, somewhere in that range. We're looking to update the model with newer emissions figures, but in the meantime, we just need to get a proof of concept and we're already getting a little bit of traction with the project. We're using it internally at most Mass Global where I work and we've got some um, external th stakeholders who are interested in uh, the project uh, and adopting it in their organizations. So we wanna make sure this is a really good uh, tool, as useful as possible while acknowledging, you know, just the uncertainty uh, that underpins this whole uh, idea. And to that end, today we're going to be looking at how to uh, <laughs> kind of uh, lend certainty in software development by adding unit tests. It's something a little bit of a maintenance task that we have overlooked. So um, in the process of writing the unit tests, we'll see more um, how the library works and we'll have some opportunities to discuss um, the implementation details or the what's involved with estimating carbon of mobility, uh, carbon emissions, CO2 emissions. Um, mobility, things like that, and how to even just, you know, uh, create Python packages as well as a REST API. I should mention also the reason we're um, wrapping this in a REST API is because not every organization is using Python for their project projects or products, and, um, you know, sort of uh, REST is the universal, <laughs> you know, ling universal language right now, sort of, of the, the internet. Uh, I know there are more um, exciting um, things like GraphQL and things, uh, which might not be really s be relevant here uh, when we don't have like a graph of entities. We sort of have just one endpoint that serves up some data. It's like a remote procedure call over HTTP. So mm, REST is the way to go, right? Let's um, take the tried and true kind of boring technologies and just make something useful, hopefully, for other people. All right. so. My colleague Marcus Shipke or Marcus Shepard 
has written uh, this library. It's really remarkable. Uh, his uh, Python proficiency. We've packaged it in a number of ways, uh, actually, to be honest. We've got an API that is packaged for deployment on Docker as well as serverless so that you can deploy it on m multiple um, kind of cloud providers, you know, AWS. I think serverless should just be cross platform. I don't think we have anything that's really AWS specific. It's just really returning a response. So you just invoke a function that um, receives a post request. I think we had to do post so we could pass in some parameters. <laughs> that's one of the perennial questions about um, REST, I guess, is if you're um, essentially not doing a transformation, not doing any you know, not storing any data or changing any data, um, but you need to pass some parameters. What's the appropriate um, method, HTTP verb, to use get or post? And I think we wanted to. I think the problem is Git doesn't allow headers <laughs> or something like that. And so if you want to pass things in a header, let's see, event params. Uh, well, we're using query string parameters. Oh, anyway, I'll look at why this. Was, this was also written by our colleague, Ruslan. Uh, in any case, I, I'm not going to be working at this level. I'm going to be working in this Python package here. It's called the estimator package. And we've actually published this on Python packaging index. So I just want to check. Our environment is here. So I actually can probably just open this folder directly. This this estimator folder so that I don't get uh, kind of bounced around um, and that I'm in the right environment. Yeah, let's just do that. So we have our pip file here and VS Code will automatically detect um, your environment metadata, like your pip file, or even poetry, or you know, requirements text, things like that, and act, and it'll do things like activating your uh, environment when you. Well, it's supposed to do that. I think I haven't. Uh, so it's just maybe I haven't instantiated this environment here. Let's. Uh, how do you do pip in? Let's double check that. Yeah, it's got to create the environment. Okay, while it's doing that, I'll be right back. Let's check. Uh, I got a message on my phone. I'll just double check that real quick. All right, looks like we're good to go. Now you can see we're in a, the um, pip in here, estimator, estimator <laughs> uh, environment. Now I'm going to exit out and just see something here. Uh, exit out of the environment and then exit out of the shell. Now if I open a new terminal with um, VS Code, hmm. Normally it'll see there's a pip file here and activate it. You know. I might not have the Python hmm. preferences, extensions. There's a lot of great extensions for VS Code. And in fact, the um, Eclipse Foundation has built, they've kind of, like, I don't know if it's a fork, but uh, they've based their latest online IDE on uh, VS Code. It's sort of like compatible with VS Code. I was just reading about this yesterday. Um, this is really interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about using this. Uh, Let's find the name of it. 
projects. Cookies. Project projects. How do I get to it? Search projects. How about I list? They have this online. Oh, Eclipse Che is what the thing is called. There's a bunch of stuff for Eclipse. Man, I should really check these people out too. I really like the Apache Foundation and the Eclipse Foundation. It's looking more and more interesting each time I look at it. But uh, it's called Eclipse Che. Whoops. <laughs> and they're about to release, or they did release, version 7. And it's an IDE that runs in the browser. I don't know if it's like, so you have to use Kubernetes to use it. It might be a little bit overkill, but I don't know. But the cool thing, uh, among other things, I guess, about it that stood out to me at least is it's VS Code compatible. So like any VS Code extension runs in this. The user experience is modeled after VS Code. And I just wonder if it's so Kubernetes-centric. Uh, I didn't realize that. I'm not... I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible when I develop if I don't need to use a container framework or anything I would prefer not to uh, but I'm trying to find the name of this other project they, they've they switched out the front end to this VS Code related project called Thea and Thea IDE has a good link I'll post this in the chat if you're interested in checking it out it's Uh, let's see, and then looks like Twitch is changing the. No, they're not really changing how things are laid out. Here it is. I have to refresh, so I'm not able to connect to the chat right now. Looks like I've got enough bandwidth. My stream is there. It goes. Yeah, so it's theide.org. There we go. And I guess they have a stable release, and Eclipse J7 has adopted this as opposed to some other um, browser-based IDE. You can see it's just running right here in a tab in your browser. <laughs> I mean, VS Code is pretty much running in uh, JavaScript. It's written in JavaScript and uh, using the... Um, oops, what's that thing that GitHub made? The <laughs> Electron framework. So it's kind of running a browser anyway. It's Chromium. Uh, a lot of contributors... So one of the appealing parts of this is that it's backed by a, sort of a vendor neutral platform. It's not just, you know, Microsoft sort of dictating how the thing emerges, which is not all that bad. Uh, I'm not trying to harsh on Microsoft, but um, certainly a foundation is going to give you a little bit more neutrality, a little less maybe controversy. Hopefully there has been some controversy specifically in um, VS Code about the telemetry that was being collected. I think that's been resolved. So you can see Red Hat, Google, IBM, I think Mozilla is even somehow contributing here. And essentially it's uh, designed to be more modular. I'm not sure if that means it's just easier to extend or why that it's more modular than VS Code. Uh, runs in the cloud, which is kind of cool, or on a desktop. Ah, uh, yeah, the Vendor Neutral Open Source Foundation. So yeah, and it, you know, whatever you're running. And uh, Language Server Protocol gives you really deep um, integration with your language and environment. It'll look through your packages for you know, method names and things like that and documentation. It's really great. It's been one of the most productive things. I, um, I was using Atom for a long time, just regular um, text editors prior to that. Atom started giving me a taste of, with a few extensions, what it's like to have um, more integrated experience. The, but the shortcomings is that the it wasn't really integrated. It was sort of, you had to rely too heavily on extensions. I switched to PyCharm for a while. That was my first like experience, aside from dabbling with um, NetBeans and Eclipse years ago um, and RStudio. Uh, PyCharm was like a revelation because at that point I was just doing more full-time development and then just immediately started to appreciate having you know, go to definition and doc strings and everything right in line with the code and autocomplete and all that good stuff. Um, but then, long short of it, I kind of came around to VS Code because i um, still looking for an open source IDE and it's been one of the most holistic experiences I've had in the open source IDE realm. You do still need to rely on packages, but, uh, you know, 
I think this, for example, this Python one is pretty mature, and I've already got it installed. Maybe there's an update available. No. So just for whatever reason, it didn't fit, pick up my um, pip in, but that's not a big deal. Neither here nor there. So let's go ahead and continue the stream. Yes. Let me see. It should be. Maybe it's just not realizing I'm in a Python environment. I think what's going to happen if I open a Python file, then it knows we're in Python. Yes, I, okay. And it's thinking I'm in a Django project, but I'm not really in a Django project. Now I exit out the terminal. Let's see what happens if I open a terminal now. It knows we're in Python. It ah, activates the vir uh, virtual environment. So, yeah, I guess that makes sense. You don't have a file open to. Um, VS Code is not going to scan through all your files and look for like the majority of rules if you've got Markdown and Python files and maybe HTML. Hmm, I don't know, but yeah, all right, good to go. Figured that one out. So this is really cool. What we did basically is um, to make it easy to package and deploy and share this packet, uh, this project, we forked this. Um, Marcus Shepard here is my collaborator. You'll see these authors here. Um, and uh, he's the key author, I'll admit. Um, so this is cool. He's very excellent, uh, develop, excellent engineer, very intelligent, very hi highly mathematical, highly, highly analytical. I'm learning a lot working with Marcus. Uh, he's a machine learning engineer, data scientist. So here is this setup pie we um, Marcus recommended we use, and essentially it just gives you a quick boilerplate to um, add project metadata. Which, by the way, we're going to be looking at looking uh, using pyproj.yaml. It's like a new pep. Tomo, <laughs> similar. What is pyproj? Tomo, pyproject Tomo. It's used by. It's an official Python packaging format where you define your dependencies, your packaging dependencies. It's relating to another there's two peps that go together 518 and like 426 or something like that that complement one another and uh, give us a standardized way in Python to define packaging metadata which is important now so that the, these higher level tools can start adopting a common format um, so essentially we've been looking at you know so for example you know pip pipn does its own format uh, which I think is, was necessary at the time Pippin was created. Probably they didn't have pyproj.toml. But this other um, poetry, uh, has adopted the pyproj.toml as its metadata standard. And we're pretty impressed with poetry. <laughs> Honestly, some of these features from Pippin and poetry are, you know, they're sort of getting imported into Pip. And most importantly, this constraint solving. Um, it's going to be landing in PIP soon. So it's nice that the higher, these projects can offer a higher level API, but it's really important that they start to kind of uh, be cross compatible so that you can standardize on, on how your dependencies are defined and things like that. And essentially that you could build with whatever tool then and publish with whatever tool because it's all using common infrastructure and should have relatively similar results if not this is supposed to be reproducible that's the goal right and this dependency resolver is really cool and poetry just has a lot of nice touches but pip and viz great too though um, my preference right now is poetry <laughs> i just like i don't know these little touches like on their website is kind of crazy um, and just the way the messaging is formatted for you Very cool. All right. So, toast to Python packaging <laughs> and online IDEs. So, everything I do in these live streams, I'm learning along the way. I don't profess to be uh, knowledgeable or expert in any of these areas, including unit testing in Python. But what we're going to do, I think, is just create a uh, tests folder either in the root. Uh, we're going to create a branch. So uh, 
Now we will be able to, be able to do a pull request, proper peer review, that good stuff. Good, good, good. Now, from what I can tell, the well, everything in the library lives here in this folder, and I think that would, would naturally be the place to put the tests. Actually, if we're going to be so from transport import CO2 import, or it would it be from estimator import? Well, that's the first question. Where do you put your tests? In a root level or in the library level? What's common? We're writing a library. For, for file module.py, the unit test should normally be called test module.py, following Pythonic naming conventions. Oh. In the same directory as module.py, or in the tests, test module.py, at the same level. Heck, why don't I just put it right next to there? Test estimator and test model.py. <laughs> and if we want to put them in a folder, let me just read this. At the same level as the code directory. Ah, so, so dot dot slash means go up a level. That's confusing. At the same level. And we're in test module pi. One level under the code directory. Wouldn't this do one level under the code directory? What do you mean under the code directory also? Because in which way's up in a tree, in a file system tree, which way's up? <laughs> the default unit test pattern, this is what we're looking at, is test startup pi. It's probably just easier if I just do this in the same directory. Uh, so we have a module, which this is our module. And we have a... And we're using PyTest, good practices. spills over <laughs> hmm yeah so let's go in the same folder. need to install development uh, dependency which I think is just dash dash dev and we agreed to use PyTest instead of the built-in unit test uh, framework, or I think it builds on it. I think it's a tendency in Python, at least, to build on things, um, add la layers of abstraction and functionality. We'll see if that's the case here. So yeah, locking dev packages. Nice. 
I have seen talks in a lot of projects, so I didn't know what it was for necessarily. Or oh, that link's not working. Hmm. It links to itself. Alright. I mean, it's still a good answer. It's a little confusing, but... Uh use the package as it would be used which auto pep 8 isn't in, not installed we do want that but we're using black which should also install auto pep 8 that's strange Oh, and it automatically allows pre-releases. That's cool. That's been a problem. Uh, Black is still alpha or beta. It doesn't have an official release yet. <laughs> but we are just not going to argue about formatting rules. We're just going to use <laughs> use Black. It's not all this perfect, but it's pretty good. So just so you have the... Uh... That's part of the Python Software Foundation? Hmm. Interesting. Didn't know that. Here it is in the chat. Anybody on the watching the stream can see these links. That way they don't go away. And if people join the stream late, they can kind of see what we've been talking about. But essentially black just makes the decisions for you. You can override it. Certain rules, I believe. But we haven't fought with it too much. It's been pretty good for our needs. So now if I save, it should auto format on save and it just added a little bit of white space there, extra line, I think was the main thing. So nice, that way our code is just lent it up for us as we go along. So essentially we want to make an estimation. So how do we use this? Estimator pi should be self-explanatory, right? Mode, distance in kilometers. So let's do something basic. Uh, mode is bus. Ten kilometers. See this is what I'm talking about. Stuff like this is super useful. You get the documentation right there in line. <laughs> if the uh, developer has written the code and Marcus follows really good coding practices. So it's been like a, a very uh, excellent to work with him. I've learned a lot. I'm still learning a lot every day. So that's the joy of having really talented colleagues. All right. So then we want to assert the thing equals something. I don't know what it should equal though. Um, 
so how do we even run these? I just want to print that out. And I'll just assert true. And uh, can I run? Yeah, I think you can make multiple assertions, so I can just print that also. Or debugger it. But uh, Or debug it. Debugger is JavaScript. And then I can run the debugger here. How do we just run the test? So, and my mouse is a little bit jittery. CO2 estimate. All right. So essentially, you just say PyTest. <laughs> That's it. From the No module found named estimator. No module found named estimator. Named estimator. Ah, uh, so the module. E S T I M A T O R. E S T I M A T O R. I think it's that I need to put it up on level and say test transport CO2. Hmm. Yes, actually, that was what I wanted to do. This doesn't seem right. I don't think I'm doing this right. Test transport CO2. Let's try that, then. I could say learning journey. That's the fun, fun part. All right. Now let's did it work? Assert false. I guess it's not verbose unless you something fails. That makes sense. There we go. All right, but I'm not getting my print. Python terminal. Actually, what about iPython? I'll install it as a dev dependency. Let me get let me commit these dependencies. So we are we have granular commits here. So add pytest and um, see black was already in there, but I think what happened was we didn't have pre-releases. So there we go. Let's see. So pipin. Dev, I like uh, Python. I hope that it's not gonna be too heavy though. It's not automatically available, but it might be possible to enable it. If it's too fancy, then I'll just... Mm. 
well, how many dependencies is this going to add? I'm a little bit worried, um, coming from like, you know, JavaScript to where you get to really dependency heavy, it's not the same in Python, I know. And really, I'm just doing this to save a couple of keystrokes for me. It's just laziness. It's also just really cool. I'm going to do it. <laughs> Let's just see. I'll remove it if it's like hundreds of dependencies or tens of dependencies. It's not like I'm installing Jupyter Lab, which is that has a lot of things. But IPython is a nice developer tool. Um, alternatively, I am using the IDE. I could just be running the code there. <laughs> In fact, why don't I didn't listen. That's one thing is um, poetry just gives you line by line what it's installing. 55 total dependencies, but how many new dependencies, I wonder. Right, let's take a look. Refresh. Pip file added. One top level dependency. Not too bad. In our dev packages. Probably can get away with that. But. But. We've got back call, decorator, IPython and Gen Tools, Jedi, Parso, Pexpect, Pexpect. I mean, it seems pretty reason reasonable. So. Because then I can do this. Oh yeah. This is really cool tendency in um, the data science community. Language agnostic. Language agnosticity. In other words, we can get beyond like Python versus R or Python versus well, Java, but or something like that. Uh, more specifically, Python, R, Julia, um, LaTeX, I suppose. Those are all kind of coming together in strange ways, in interesting ways, under the Jupyter umbrella. Uh, what's the name of it? There's this foundation also that promotes those languages in open source data science ecosystem. So yeah, this is cool. We're kind of getting a little bit of a harmony uh, while innovating in different directions independently. Um, but I like that. I think it's a good direction. Maybe JavaScript will come into the loop as well. You can do a lot with JavaScript. It's a pretty good uh, language. The ecosystem's got some issues. I prefer Python language, but that's my preference. All right, then. Welcome to the chat. If you have any suggestions or questions about the project, just let me know. This is uh, definitely a uh, hangout oriented stream. It's a participatory, participatory stream. If you uh, got any projects you're working on and could use some advice or peer review, I'm glad to do that also. I've got some time available to do that at IPython. All right, so now we can just have a little bit of tab autocomplete. All that just so I could do from transport. Oh, it's, oh wait, it's working slowly. Nice, though. Uh, and who knows whatever other benefits will be coming from IPython. It's just a good opportunity to learn the tooling. So what we want to do is just test it out. Our estimate CO2 call here. Just copy and paste that. And then I can assert it equals what I expected to equal. Oof, goodness gracious. Those floats are going to get us.
Oh, this is part of the problem. So actually, come on. Oops, I started a collaboration session. That's another thing I'm working on on the stream is uh, for people who are active in the chat and the Hangouts, um, you can actually come in here and live code with me. I've got this VS Code extension called LiveShare installed, and it has like voice, uh, and you can share the buffer. You can actually um, run, change the code, run it in the shell, access the, uh, via HTTP calls, just like it's running on your local machine. It's a really cool plugin. Uh, that's one thing. Just this VS Code ecosystem is taken off. It's really great. And if you see these links over here in the Hangout chat. Um, Theta IDE is one to keep an eye on if you're interested in open source IDEs that run in a browser. It's pretty crazy. Uh, but yeah, so basically I just want to do 10 kilometers, not 19 kilometers. So we, I hope we'll, we'll get a, no, still a lot of uh, significant digits. Well, heck, I'll have to figure out what to do about that. But, uh, I guess just that. Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna change the one significant digit at the end of it, and uh, it's very precise, very precise. Then we'll come back over to our second Python shell. What? So we, what's this Bash shell doing? Nothing really. All right. And we'll just run our PyTest again. Should fail. And see, this is what I was afraid of actually. The output is different man because this is literally the output I pasted here six seven nine so yeah if anyone's working with Python what should I do here with this floating point stuff these uh oh 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 of course gotta have my same values in there in there uh, for the test so 10 kilometers I thought would give us a round number but no it's not gonna do that but now we should pass assert true no problems there cool <laughs> Now I'm wondering if we should just run these assertions against different modes of transport. Because essentially we'll, we know the estimator works in this case, but we have several modes we support. In which case if I just estimate CO2 bus, is that okay? Hundred percent test, and if I change it, fail. So yeah, it's um, that's gonna work. All right, let's do that for each mode. One thing I like about this um, sort of test-driven design. Uh, idea how do you uh, describe your cases where it's sort of rather than showing you the raw code it says should this or should that um, I don't know if that's TDD or something similar what's stack abuse <laughs> is this part of the stack overflow network or something different no this is somebody's blog is it or some people. That's interesting. Uh, TDD is just, I guess, writing tests before you write the functionality. It's not quite what I'm getting at, but it's sort of like a, what do you call it, cucumber. I don't know if you can have your salad and eat your cucumber. <laughs> what I'm getting at is uh, BDD. Behavior driven development should these are expressing should ooh I don't know if we want to get all to that level though but uh, <coughs> I first let me just check relatively recent update good coverage um. Contributors kind of tapering off, but you know, it's been sort of steady through 2019. It's been around for a while. It's a good sign. Look like it lost the original core contributors in the past year or so. 
but some new people. At least one guy stepped in. A couple, a few drive-bys. Ah, I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna add another dependency. Get another dependency. So I'm just gonna do this once for each mode. I think we have five modes here. Let me just open up our docs. Let's see if we even come up in Google search results. Hey, there we are. Number two. Hey, that's always a good sign when you're Googleable. By the way, anyone who's just joined this stream, you might notice the donation box down below. Uh, I'm collecting, I've set a goal of 100 euros. I'm trying to collect donations for Age UK charity. All the donations are handled directly through Just Giving. I don't do any of the uh, donation processing or anything. All the donations will go to the featured charity, Age UK. And um, when we meet that goal, or yeah, when we meet the goal, let's just say um, I'll, do I'll double the donation. So every dollar that's donated up to the 100 euros goal, I'll donate 100 euros essentially. Dollar, 100 euros. Uh, yeah, so I'll match it up to 100 euros and really hoping to get just some traction on this donation thing. I just put it online yesterday. Again, it's through a third party. I don't handle any of the money or anything. None of the proceeds go to me at all. None of, none of the proceeds go to Just Giving even. All of it goes directly to the uh, Age UK and you can optionally give Just Giving a small uh, tip, so to speak. And I will, don I will donate the same matching value once we hit 100 euros. I'll be grateful for every donation that comes in. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. And looks like we got some dependency vulnerabilities. Those might be resolved here when we um, when I push this up. I didn't run an upgrade against things, but in any case, let's check it out. What our modes are. So the README and the estimator method is fairly well documented. I might just need to enumerate them. Yeah. Let's try light rail. And distance 10 kilometers, occupancy. So that's another thing we have to test overriding the occupancy. I could just end up writing a whole bunch of uh, test cases here. You know, maybe that's a good, good thing to do, good use of time. That way we know if our model changes is essentially what we're trying to do. The key though is our model is going to change over time, but we want to revision it. We want to say version two of the model. So I think we'll have to add a parameter. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to figure that one out. To say what version of the model. We're using data from 2015 environmental uh, European Environmental Agency, EEA, and the uh, vehicles in general are getting more uh, fuel efficient, um, the model is pretty Europe centric, we want to make this useful worldwide and have all these parameters to be so that you can override them with known information. So there's a lot of features on our roadmap as well including calculating or estimating CO2 by liters of fuel consumed in the vehicle for example. You might not always know the distance traveled but you might know the vehicle's um, liters of fuel um, consumed in some cases apparently so that was a feature request we got so if you want to check out the discussion the roadmap for the project the source code just go to github.com mass global sustainable mobility api it's right there above the video ah, so here we go let's just uh let's just enumerate these modes over here in the ipython shell and i just gotta yeah just do that and that. So there we go. Light rail, small car, large car, scooter, and bus. And we'll just repeat this little process here for each of the. Uh, so light rail. Oops. I'm really. I probably should be just using idle 140. <laughs> to be honest. It's a really nice one also. Uh, 
And the next one, so we got light rail, we got bus, small car. We're just gonna go top to bottom now. Actually, check, check this out. And basically, if you want to make a donation, I'll mention, um, we'll be showing the names of all the donors across the screen here. Um, you can scan that little QR code here. Uh, what is it to my, over there? <laughs> or click the link below, and uh, it'll take you right to Just Giving. It's, it's a legitimate um, charity, I believe it's a, I think it's a charity. I'm not sure it's incorporated in the UK. So I think it's a legitimate company. It's not, we're not trying to scam. This is actually, um, trying to get uh, donations for a good cause and picked the age UK because they have a currently um, a coronavirus assistance program where they're helping elderly people who are already experiencing social isolation in a lot of cases uh, not just through social distancing they're helping to promote their well-being in active lifestyle uh, including bringing them hot meals spending time with them stuff like that so uh, that is certainly a, um, a a group of demographic who is in great need during this coronavirus crisis so thank you for your donations i appreciate those in advance and that link you'll get credit here on the uh um, the stream video and it'll appear in the little um progress bar i think should just work i haven't tested it out yet though as you can see there's no first donor i should probably just donate and see if that it works correctly all right, so we got small car, and that gave us 1120. Looks, oh dang! All right, now we're gonna do uh, large car. SD. It's a big number. A lot of significant digits. I'll get feedback on this. We're going to do peer review to see if like we should be rounding these or what. <laughs> probably. We'll probably just round them up or down or something. Because um, I'm not sure that these these are grams. The estimate isn't grams CO2. It's not explicit here. Yeah, so you got a half a gram. These I don't think are. <laughs> that's such a. That's nothing almost. It's like a couple. Uh, getting down to the atomic weight. With that level of precision. Something like that. I don't know. All right. So we got car. We got scooter. The interesting thing is. These are. Um, like mopeds and stuff. It's not e-scooters. That's a whole new thing. Uh, which we do have on our roadmap the ability to incorporate additional modes like electric cars which poses its own challenges because electric cars we're not combusting co2 we're not essentially using fossil fuels at the point of uh, use uh, but we're using fossil fuels oftentimes to generate the electricity uh, so how do we include that in our models that's an open question we're gonna have to um, try to answer and again we're trying to rely on official so to speak data it's not necessarily official but more like evidence-based organizations who've done the research and we can just use it in our python library so if you know of any um, sources of data that are calculating co2 equivalent emissions per passenger kilometer and you know electric cars and e-scooters things like that uh, i'll be grateful to look into those hey what's up don't drink and drive bro I haven't seen you in a while. I, I think I recognize your screen name. Haven't you been on the stream before? Welcome. Oh my god, are you making models right now? We are, yeah, we're modeling transportation CO2 data. We're, we're building on a model from the European uh, Environmental Agency, but yeah, we're kind of doing that. So is that what you mean, like uh, sort of statistical models? Or what do you mean by models? <laughs> and do you do this kind of work also? 
Okay, cool. Hey, and uh, if you are interested in learning, we can use help on this project. It's actually in use in the mobility industry right now as we speak. Uh, at my company, we're using this tool internally uh, with some big plans. I can't really kind of disclose those yet until we'll make a public uh, announcement about it. Uh, I think in the next three months, um, three to six months, it depends. <laughs> There's a lot of things in the air right now. But uh, yeah, so this is a good way to get some practical experience. And um, okay, so welcome back, Don't Drink and Drive, bro. Uh, yeah, I remember I was trying to shorten your name. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. When you were here last time, I was trying to think how I could say your name in fewer syllables. Very cool. So, do you uh, are you interested in um, participating in some open source development? You're a senior in high school right now. Oh, this is the perfect opportunity because then you can actually help us on a project that's getting use uh, again in industry and uh, our company. And then we do have some other interest. Uh, in the mobility industry, we're called mobility as a service. It's sort of an alternative to private car ownership. The idea is that nobody should really have to own their own car, you know, because the cars just sit there most of the time. I think it's something like, I can't remember, 80% of the lifespan of a car is just sitting on the driveway, basically, or on the side of the road, you know, while you're at work, while you're in the grocery store, while you're at home. And you need the car only for some of your trips. Like spontaneous visit to grandma's house might be one if you're taking gifts or something, or the um, trip to the grocery store, you might need some space in the trunk. Uh, but most of the stuff, and even those types of trips, can be solved by a, pr a good service provider. And all you need, it, you're concerned about mobility, and we provide a service. And this is, mobility is a service industry. There's a lot of new companies coming up, big companies and small. Our company's kind of a medium one. You know, everyone from Google, uh, Uber's part of the picture, a lot of scooter companies, Bird. You're going to Purdue next year, very cool. What are you going to major in? Uh, or yeah, not. So I don't want to follow this idea that you should have your career mapped out at this point, heck no. And in fact, um, I'm just actually wanting to know what you're interested in at this point. In fact, uh, it might be good that you consider taking a gap year I don't know if you have that opportunity or if you're doing that now, but just to do some exploration and live in life a little bit, you know, not boozing up and uh, destroying your life, so to speak, you know, like degrading your life, at least going down a slope, but, you know, elevating yourself, getting involved with some um, communities, maybe doing an internship, going, uh, uh, woofing worldwide opportunities on organic farms. You, it might just give you an interesting tangent, uh, interesting path to follow. So yeah, I actually um, was, I had the opportunity to do an internship at a school called the Woolman School, and it's primarily for high school juniors, seniors, and gap year school uh, people who are just wanting to take some time between high school and college and just kind of let life, you know, breathe into them, inspire them, and uh, really transformative place. It transformed my life. Uh, unfortunately, the Woolman um, School doesn't do that um, program anymore, but they have uh, other things, but it really helped me understand the importance of finding your fit in the universe and what inspires you. They led me to doing this kind of work in mobility, because at that point I was trying not to, you know, it's sort of serendipitous how the path I followed, and I think that most of us follow, of course. But you can look back and see these these strange events. Like I was trying not to live, uh, trying to live without a car, trying to live sustainably, sort of learning about environmentalism and um, stewardship, things like that. And you know, a few years later, then I sort of emerged into this opportunity here today. Oh uh, yeah, the Woolman Woolman. Um, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of opportunities. Woolman is a very special place. Uh, still um, has like a summer camp called the Sierra Friends Center. It's in California. Um, but they had to stop the Woolman semester. They have this outdoor school for high school um, students 
to get in touch with nature and learn about conservation and stewardship and stuff like that. I'll put you the link here. But uh, I found out about Woolman. There's two main ways to kind of plug in uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. There's probably a lot of other ones, but uh, it depends on what direction you're heading in life and your interests, of course. But sometimes these environments can actually help you discover your interests that you didn't realize. They help make it more clear. They kind of refine you um, in a way like, um, you know, separating the gold from the, uh, what's that called? The, the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, or the, yeah. So uh, idealist. Are you in the United States, by the way, or Europe, or where are you located? If you don't mind my asking, I'll just do a quick search. Um, you can see I'm in Tampere, Tampere, Finland. But this idealist.org essentially, yeah, and if you want to disclose, oh, 11 messages were deleted by an officer, a moderator. Oh, what happened? Don't drink and drive, bro. Did. Uh, what, what did you post? Um, sorry, it's just using the default uh, settings. I don't know what. Uh, 11 messages were deleted by you. Jeez. So that purge action is harsh. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry about that. It purged all your messages. Uh, sorry. Let me just disable that. I thought it would just purge the one message that was... Uh, had a curse word in it or whatever the heck. We're trying to keep it family friendly here is all. And it hasn't been a problem. I uh, just enabled the Streamlab so, so I could do a few extra things like showing the chat on here so uh, a big blob of your interests yeah and one of them probably has <laughs> a word in there or a fragment of a word yeah let me see can you uh, send me your interests uh, whisper them to me um, send me a whisper a private message and I'll I'll see him there let me just uh, change the Streamlabs setting too, because that was too harsh. To, it deleted all your messages. I'm sorry about that. It should just give you a warning or something. Oh, and now my chat is totally... All right, well, I just got to, I'm going to have to disable that until I figure it out better. Sorry about this. Let me just fix it. Thanks for helping me <laughs> uh, troubleshoot my my stream here as well. This is unfortunate when, like, uh, oh, good intention, a well-intentioned uh, um, bot trying to keep the room clean is being a little bit too, <laughs> I don't know, what's the word? All right, so we have mini games, mod tools. I will just disable word protection altogether. So just help me co-moderate if we um, anal, that was what it was. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we got to be able to say analysis on this channel. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, makes sense. By the way, how's the stream quality? Are you able to read the text? I'm in the middle of like updating this stream. I, I bumped the quality down so it wouldn't take up so much bandwidth, but I don't want to lower the quality threshold so bad where it, the text is not legible on screen because we're a live coding website. But uh, yes, yeah, so Chicago. I'm originally from Kansas, so I'm, I'm your neighbor. I was at one point, not anymore. So yeah, I just basically search for everything here. And what this means is you'll get job postings, 
it'll show you organizations and internships and events. So I didn't filter down by any particular thing. Um, and my approach to this has been, depending on where you're at, uh, you could maybe get an entry level job at one of these organizations. That's certainly true. Um, but essentially it's find the organization that sounds cool a little bit to you, somehow it like resonates with you. See if they have any volunteer opportunities, any internships. And even if they don't have any job postings, volunteer opportunities or internships, um, make contact. Because oftentimes you'll open the door just by, just by contacting them. And just start getting your feet wet in a few of these places. Um, doing some volunteer work, you'll build a resume, you'll build practical experience, you'll actually help, you know, the community, help improve your community. And yeah, of course, you can use this search tool to refine it by your interests and things like that. I haven't uh, been using this in a while, but looks like they've refined it or they've changed the interface. Uh, this is kind of cool. The, the email alert is actually what I set up. I had some some queries that I had created for like jobs, then you um, kind of save that query and they'll email it to you whenever there's new results. Let's see what the filters. So it allows you to filter by location, job type, you know, if you were interested in grant writing or conservation, or you can get very specific to your interests, photography, reading, design, you know, whatever it is you're interested in doing a little bit of. If you're mathematical and uh, analytical, you probably would be interested in technology and IT jobs and volunteers, opportunities and internships. Stuff like that. So yeah, you just kind of tailor fit it to your interests. And you can either just search and find some stuff. You know, if you're interested in agriculture or animals or music and art, climate relief. And then if you want it, be more lazy about it, just set up the email uh, alert and then, you know, once every week or two, depending on how broad your search criteria is, you'll get some new results. And the other one is woofing. Worldwide opportunities on organic farms. If you want to um, maybe travel a little bit and uh, practice the still life and make friends and um, maybe even get a whole new path in life. Uh, this might be a good one. And you know, these these farms oftentimes need technology help too. So it's not just like you're going to be living off grid and isolated from your <laughs> smartphone or anything like that. It's, uh, you know, the Woolman School, for example, it's they have a sustainable, like an organic biodynamic garden. It's part of their um, program and they do outdoors education. But also, you know, students bring their smartphones and laptops and are writing essays and we have a campus-wide wireless network. So yeah, you're not like having to go here and be some kind of permit or unplugged. Um, but yeah, it's certainly you'll make friends and friends for life, I think, in some in some cases. So it's really cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, if you send me your email and uh, if you have a GitHub username, and we can I can ping you on GitHub. We can add you as a collaborator, excuse me, to this project. This Transport CO2 project right now is the main one where we could use some help. I have a couple of other um, open source projects that maybe you could get involved with, um, depending on your interests. If you're like interested in agriculture, tech is cool. Ah, yeah, there's this, um, let me just think here for a second. I bet you would like this. There's a wiki, a whole community dedicated to this. I just can't remember the farm bot. It's like sustainable technology. Well, apparently there's a lot of them, so this is kind of cool. Oh, yeah, wiki. Something like sustainable tech wiki or something.
Yeah, well, this might be something that would be interesting to you, open source ecology. That way you could use, your, you know, your engineering and analytical skills to help produce feed, food, to help feed people. And I'll try to remember this, the other name, um, but I'm not going to, I can't, it's not coming to me right now. But yeah, it's like open source, um, openly licensed, they have jobs and stuff. Oh, I almost said it. it's like justify or right technology or something like that. Appropriate technology. And there's a wiki relating to it. Apropedia. This is the one I was trying to think of. <laughs> it's kind of a strange phrase, but uh, I think these communities, the whole thing is, you know, just get involved in community, right? Plug into something bigger and better, uh, so to speak, and um, it'll transform your life. You know, you, you dedicate yourself to something bigger and uh, not drinking and driving, not alcohol. That's what the first half of my adult life so far uh, was spent in going downward slope, drinking, drug abuse, stuff like that. So, you know, it sort of it shaped me and uh, I learned a lot. I made a lot of mistakes, certainly. Uh, but now I'm trying to put myself in an upward slope for a while now and surround myself with people who are on a similar path, you know, of self-improvement and, and building one another up and investing in community, investing in um, improving things. So yeah, I think if you're on that wavelength, then these will be good communities for you too. Yeah, especially during quarantine when we need something to occupy our time. And it's a great opportunity, I think. Uh, it's a mixed blessing, the social distancing. Uh, for me, at least, this has given me an opportunity to just kind of slow down. I'm still doing work, uh, which I'm really blessed to be able to do. And um, But I'm also just able to slow down. I've been kind of getting in touch with sort of my personal interests and, uh, you know, exploring music more, um, trying to do, find ways of doing exercise that are not going to the gym, uh, drinking a lot of tea, stuff like that. So yeah. What are, what else are you doing to keep yourself occupied? So our last one is scooter. And for a 10 kilometer scooter trip, seven twenty. Let's run these tests. I wonder if I can just put these shells side by side. Everybody's passing. Good. Yeah, okay, so you got wrapped up into self, uh, self-destructive patterns pretty young then. Mm-hmm. Middle school, yeah. That's kind of when mine started too. Um, I don't know the exact source of it, but uh, yeah. My trouble started a little bit in middle school then by sophomore year in high school I was kind of like out of control basically just doing a lot of hanging out with the wrong people drugs alcohol and that carried over into my uh, through phases but into my 20s uh, mid 20s so yeah <laughs> it's hard to get out of that certainly engineering life sets physiology stuff PubMed all right, daily scheduling. Yeah, how do you stay on schedule? That's an interesting challenge, isn't it? A unique random thing. Oh yeah, that's crazy, yeah. Yeah, it's 
pretty profound. And uh, something I probably neglected too. I've got, you know, trouble sleeping and, and um, focusing and stuff like that. And probably a lot of it is just lack of consistent uh, exercise. Yeah. I'm trying to do a little bit of exercise. Um, you know, go go walking outside, um, doing Pilates a couple times a week lately. I'm not haven't got a routine around it yet. Super dedicated, but it is really good. The times I I do it, it's like full body. You can feel it. I'm sweating. It's good stuff. Yeah, exactly. You don't <laughs> minimize the time of exercise. That's right. It's, it's hard to motivate. Hard to be motivated to get that get there to the gym or get to the yoga mat or whatever your type of exercise you're doing I do need to get like a little yoga mat or something like that no shame in the game of course yoga and Pilates I think are very interesting and effective a whole body kind of holistic um, regimens so to speak exercise regimen Pilates is crazy like I'm, I'm just at a beginning level and I'm taking this course on Udemy and I've come to appreciate Udemy because like you buy the course you sort of own it and you can take it at your own pace and revisit the channels they're a bit spammy. They like I know there's bad stuff about you to me. Like maybe they've even allowed people to infringe one another's work. I don't know the depths of it, but they are spammy. But the, I've got some really good courses there, and um, you know I'm comparing it with like YouTube. And you you try to do something on YouTube that's progressive and building and like following a tutorial series, and uh, it's very difficult. There's so many distractions, and the level of quality kind of sinks low. But with you to me, and probably others like edX dot or for example, you know, you get this whole course, and there's not things pulling your attention away so much, and you you have um, things to encourage your progress, like saying you completed these, here's these quizzes stuff. So anyway, I'm taking a Pilates course on there, and it's the beginning stuff is even just really challenging. I'm like shaking, my core is like shaking. All right, so we got our initial tests written. Do you ever suffer from uh, like attention issues or or depressive issues? I know this is sort of getting into very personal territory, so yeah, I don't want to um, pry. But I've had troubles since I was a kid, like in grade school, with uh, ADHD, and still trouble, still have like big big time issues with that. Um, bipolar disorder runs in my family, and so I kind of see some little bit of tendencies of like. I don't always follow through and I, I try to do like six things at once type things and I'll get manic t times where I'll stay up all night I'm just like going to do this until I get that stopping point stuff and for better or worse I just got to embrace those tendencies but also sort of um, try to calm them down uh, so I've been trying to practice mindfulness for example too mindfulness and meditation which now that we have this uh, sort of quarantine social distancing thing I've actually been able to do um, daily meditations like 10 minute meditations MIT open course where yeah that's a great one I was really interested when I was in university in Kansas uh, 2008 2009 a little bit after that I was really interested in the movement for open educational resources OER I think it kind of got smushed to death by um, the MOOCs the MOOC madness that's the open online course though there's some great stuff and to that end I like this edX because they I think they straddle the line they're sort of mooky massively open online coursey but also the you know they are actually using these MIT open courseware for example all the materials on here from what I understand are still like open educational resources meaning they're openly licensed and can be redistributed the actual the edX platform is open source it's written in Django Python Django I've never contributed to it but uh, it's called open edX and um, they have just got a good selection and they'll do certificates and stuff too but yeah um, the certificates usually cost around forty dollars or something like that but all the courses uh, you can audit them and stuff I worked through this uh, recently um, course uh, for a sustainable urban development is really good hmm. yeah 
Oh, yeah, so I just got your message. Alright, I'll just send you a quick email. That's good that it hasn't become a disorder or hasn't become unmanageable. Whoops. Apparently I can't copy from uh, from Twitch. That's weird. So right click and say copy. There it goes. I'll just put my name in the subject line so you, so you, know, you know what it's about. times a day so I don't kind of obsess over that and I'm wondering if I should have um Essentially a method for each combination of parameters or just for each mode and make multiple assertions inside of a test. I don't know how granular tests should be conventionally. For example, if I wanted to test occupancy as well as distance in kilometers, would I just duplicate all these tests and tweak the occupancy value to something? So I'm sorry about that, dude. Excuse me. What's going on with my copy key? Sorry about that. I, uh, dang. Do you want me to edit that out of this video? I'm going to upload this video to YouTube, or is it okay that I very briefly uh, pasted that in there? I'm sorry about that. Did you notice that? <laughs> I'll PM you about it. I'll whisper back to you. Sorry, man. Okay. Uh, it was very brief. It was like, I think I got it under two seconds. I don't know. And I can, if you, if you'd want, I can go back and uh, I'll download this video and I can blur that part out. But uh, it would just mean I'd have to re-encode it and before I can upload it. It's a little easier for me to, if I can just upload it directly from Twitch to YouTube. But totally, if if you, uh, if that's, if you'd be comfortable, more comfortable that way, I'll do it. No problem. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so now my copy and paste. I think it's just, I don't know, my fingers, I'll, I'll track it by my bumbling fingers, but I think sometimes it could be my keyboard. I'm using a wireless keyboard, and my computer's not on my desk, so I don't know. It doesn't happen very often. 
So now we're going to do occupancy. We'll paste all these in. We want to do kind of reasonable occupancy values. So for example, uh, a bus might have 30 passengers, but a car is not going to have 30 passengers. What's my YouTube? Uh, good question. I think it's like, I don't know, I have a custom, custom one yet, so I have to just get the link real quick. One second. How do you get to that? Right here. Yeah, I got to give you all the, the little random letters and numbers link. Yeah, I just did, the, I went there directly, let's see, like that. Um, eventually, I hope I can get a short name for that, but yeah. <laughs> Be easier to remember. Uh, yeah, and right now, I've been kind of just uploading these Hangout sessions. Uh, I was for a while trying to summarize them, but I don't have a lot of time to kind of do the live codes and uh, edit videos, or so I've been falling off of that habit. People have asked on several occasions if I can do like tutorials, so I'm thinking about that if I could put together like a you know <clears throat> like a step-by-step -step tutorial on some of this stuff that would be cool but it's not been sort of the way my brain works right now all right so now we're going to add an occupancy value and we'll just put um, the same one for all these just for a moment. All right, now bus with 10 people is reasonable, light rail with 10 people, small car with, uh, let's just say two people, large car with three people, and a scooter. Well, I don't even think this is meaningful, so, hmm. But I should vary it. Our default occupancy, I think it's set per mode. Let me double check this. <clears throat> when I look in the model, we have uh, default occupancy values. For scooter, it's 1.2 people. These are uh, statistical averages. <laughs> light rail, that's, that's, a lot of people can fit on a light rail. Let's try it with 100 on the light rail. 100 seems to be getting us in the, the right order of magnitude. What do we have for bus? 12.7. So if we put 10, car, these are all in the right order of magnitude, and all the tests should fail. We're making a model which you can track how effective mobility options are in reducing CO2 emissions. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, that's the idea, or at least let people, you know, like when you go to the grocery store, you read the label if you don't want to have a lot of sugar in your diet or if you're allergic to wheat or something. Um, so it's like transport nutritional labeling is the analogy. Um, so people can make an informed decision. We give them kind of something to compare across different modes, and it's challenging, and there are a lot of um, nuances to it. And the key thing is, how do we make the claim that they're reducing CO2 emissions? What's our baseline we're measuring against? That's another big question we're exploring. But um, usually it would be something like, compared with your last week's mobility uh, choices, this week you used less CO2. So in that sense, this week you reduced your CO2 usage or compared with your average weekly CO2 usage maybe. you know, Because it, it, it also varies over time. It's not... Uh, in the summertime or weekends, people's CO2 patterns are different than weekdays or, you know, winter, for example. It's not easy, so that's one of the design challenges that we're posed with. And right now in this project, we're sort of just at the level of how do we estimate it uh, with integrity to say that, well, this is 
you know, it's a useful model. It's we made these trade-offs and these assumptions, and that's where we stand. <laughs> I don't know. It's not easy. And then we can use it, and we're trying to use it for a pretty interesting project, which I will disclose later. I don't. I keep almost <laughs> disclosing that. I don't know. We might have already. It might be okay that I share it. I'll have to ask. Okay, so now we got different um, occupancy values. So let's go ahead and just run this. And copy and paste. See, that's weird because I've been copy and pasting quite a lot and not had any issue. Ah, see, there it is. Uh, some of it is because here I have to do Control Shift C, and here I just have to do Control V. So that could be how I bumble a little bit. Control C, Control Shift V, Control Shift C, Control V. But yeah, from from chat, you just Control C. quickly. That's pretty cool. Yeah, food. Uh, I want to say that food is one of our biggest uh, sources of CO2 emissions that we can control where we have like um, a choice basically. I essentially, I guess it's if you lower, con um, I was having some deja vu, but uh, if uh, I guess if you lower consumption in general, but uh, yeah, certainly food and mobility transport are certain uh, areas where have a lot of uh, CO2 impact, and we can make everyday decisions that can reduce that. You know, turning off lights and stuff like that's also good. Uh, usually, the, you know, see if you can get a pie chart. Yeah, basically, this one sort of supports my assertion there. Quality conscious indulger. So when you're buying food, it's one of the biggest ones. Basket, food basket. And then you got, you know, travel can be huge. And that includes, from my perspective, personal daily mobility as well as, you know, these big flights or wherever kind of travel. But I think uh, my colleague Marcus will certainly um, say this. The same thing that flight shame is is kind of misguided. It's really proportionally not uh, as significant as just not driving a personal car or something like that. Um, depending, if you're a business traveler going all around, you know, jet setting or whatever, then yeah, it makes a bigger difference. But if you're just taking a vacation once a year or something, uh, you know, traveling on a ferry would be more expensive. Your daily um, vehicular travel in a single occupancy vehicle, internal combustion vehicle could certainly outweigh that. Um, and there's graphs that show by mode. Let's see. Of transport that we've come across in our 
uh, research. Uh, Europa is a pretty good data source. But civil aviation, so you can see it, civil aviation is like um, only a small part of the pie, 13%. Then you got road transportation is huge. Cars constituting 60% of road transport. So I don't know, can't do the math. You're better at math than me. But 60% of 72% is what? So you can see what I'm saying though. I think uh, those kind of support these conjectures I'm making and just based on, you know, we've been doing this CO2 research for a while. So I kind of been able to absorb some of these uh, tidbits here and there. Here's a better one. I can compare car versus air travel here. Yeah, it's still more in the car versus air travel. It depends on how frequently you fly and stuff like that. But, you know, we drive all over the place. Now, if you look at something like this per kilometer, the, C, the well, this isn't actually including car. This is for freight, I believe, how we move goods and around air freight. Yeah, air freight. So, if yeah, if you're ordering a bunch of stuff from Amazon, which I've actually made some recent orders and I still have to, like if I order books, I got to order them online because uh, there's not a good selection of uh, English language books here in Finland and some of the books I want are very specific so I can't really get around that. And they usually come in air freight. I don't think we have a lot of ground freight bringing those in. So yeah, trade-offs. It's not simple. There's <laughs> so many layers to it, isn't there? live car free. See, this is huge. That's why one of the big things that I think is so cool to work at a company doing mobility as a service, because our goal is essentially to help people uh, not have to own a car. And in a way, um, that means they can live as free from car ownership as well as usage as possible. But it's not all, not that cars are always the wrong thing, but just mostly, most of our things, our mobility can be solved by other means, car sharing, bicycling, high density transport modes, things like that, or even um, not moving. How do, so how can a mobility company help people to reduce their mobility by offering services like grocery delivery and things like that, that might be more optimized, um, stuff like that. It's, those are interesting questions to explore. Yeah, and I've seen a couple of those like apps that'll help you do that too, where you can actually just use the app uh, and scan the items that you buy, and then it'll calculate your carbon footprint. Because I think there's pretty good databases on food sources and maybe carbon emissions used in the production of food. A big one is just, I think, getting us off of um, fossil fuels and pursuing more uh, holistic uh, agriculture, like permaculture designs and things like that, integration of different types of uh, crops, rotation, and not um, essentially, uh, what's the f way of phrasing it? Well, essentially not killing the soil, not leaving the soil barren and just destroying all of its biome, but treating the soil as like an, a living entity. Vendana Shiva, I think, has a lot to say on this. Is that how you say and she's written books on this. But if you're interested in, in uh, agriculture and, uh, and uh, feminism and um, sustainability and uh, uh, opposition to agroforestry, then this Vandana Shiva is a really inspirational activist and speaker and author. Well, let's see. Nobody's perfect. Everyone receives. Uh, Criticism, of course. Very cool. All right, so we pretty much tested out this CO estimate two estimator library with the estimate CO two function. Let's take a look at the model library because another cool thing is we've got this mode class where you instantiate the mode and it has its own estimator function um, which is basically being used internally so I don't know if I need to test this 
when we run this estimator, let's take a closer look. We essentially instantiate a mode and then run this estimate CO2 <laughs> method. So I'm testing it indirectly right now. We might want to test it at both layers. It's possible that um, you know this function will change. The internal uh, implementation of this function could change and make tests fail. <clears throat> that wouldn't be caught if I test the model directly, this enum. So probably for um, for completeness, I should do that. Maybe if I rename this, let me just double check. If I rename this to tr uh, this transpose CO2 estimator, that should work, right? And the reason for that is we have two files here, and I'd really like to least test files to live inside of this. module, but for whatever reason I can't do that. I can't figure out how to do that. similar I'm going to copy and paste and then change the internal implementation for each of these <clears throat> now with the model directly you have to provide occupancy it looks like One moment, I'm going to have to take that call. All right, cool. <laughs> my son is six, and he already gets more phone calls on my phone than me. <laughs> okay. So how do we do this? All right, yes. So the occupancy is optional. I see that now. So yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll just provide it with and without. Uh, wait. Yes. With and without occupancy. When you initiate. When you initialize it, <laughs> yeah, when you just run this method, you provide these arguments. All right. So the main way it's going to change is that we pass in 
we say mode and then we select the mode so let's get a working example I think you have to I think you have to pass this in as an uppercase. Let me just double check. Yeah, so we'll use those same. Um, just do this. We use the same parameters because we should get the same value back. I'll just paste these in so I can keep the parameter in, in view and then clean it up in a minute. I think after this I'll be at a good stopping point. Maybe can go start to think about lunch. Have a little bit of a late lunch. Late lunch. All right. So then for each of the modes, we have to just fix that first. And then we'll come back to this in a minute. what we want is just these occupancy values. Should be good to go. Oops. Mode, oh yeah, of course. Oh, uh, poop. No, no, I got all these are correct. I just imported the wrong thing. Hmm. <laughs> What's the fifty percent? Oh, because it's fifty percent of the test cases. Probably. Everybody passed. Everybody's good. Okay. So I renamed this. Oh. 
Still no donations. Come on, somebody. Just give me a five dollar donation for charity. Your name will appear on the live stream and it'll help us <laughs> to test that the donations widget is working. And it goes to a good cause. 100% of the donation goes to the charity. All right, so then basically we added all the tests for the modem. Good to go. At this point, I think um, it's a good stopping point. We've tested the two main ways of using a library and since we've added tests for both of the the arguments here, distance is always required, occupancy is optional. Um, that way, if any of the internal implementations changes, we'll still have the expected results. I'll push this up to GitHub right now, in fact, one moment. Should see pull requests. Should see a little the changes pop up here. It's nice and slow today. Compare and pull request. All right. So just for the record, here's our pull request. If anyone on the stream is interested in um, checking out the code where we're working and the process of reviewing code, things like that, that we follow, uh, you know, we're pretty laid back. We're not super strict. Uh, we just like, you know, clean and readable code. Marcus uh, will probably have some maybe su suggestions where I can put these test files or something like that or whether or not I need to write more tests or who knows but uh, we don't try to give each other too hard of a time we, we know this is all work in progress so very cool don't really have any um, credits today but I will go ahead and bring up the outro message thanks uh, this um, has been a, a nice hangout session it's been great to have a conversation with you Kyle don't drink and drive, bro. It's been nice to learn more about your interests and um, path forward in life. And uh, yeah, I hope we can do some collaboration on either this project or some other open source work. There's a lot of cool ideas and opportunities abound in the open source ecosystem. Again, we are trying out, we're experimenting with uh, having uh, matching donations for nonprofit organizations. Today's uh, goal we're working towards is to support Age UK, who offer service for, services for elderly people in the United Kingdom. Uh, in particular, they have a coronavirus fund drive right now to help elderly people who might be more isolated than normal, um, socially isolated than normal, to offer them services and activities and warm meals and things like that. All of the funds um, that are donated through the either by scanning the uh, QR code or clicking the button below the video are donated through Just Cause. Just donate, sorry. What is it? Just Giving, excuse me. Uh, they handle everything. I don't handle any of the donations. All the proceeds go directly to the charity. Just Giving asks you if you, you can um, add a little bit of a gratuity on top to support their work. I think Just Giving is also a charity. Maybe I'll have to verify that. And when we reach this 100 euro goal, I will match it. That's the thing. I could um, donate here, but then I would end up reducing the amount of donations because 
I want to match your donations. So please, uh, if you have just a, enough money uh, to buy a, uh, an extra coffee, just consider donating it towards this charity. In any case, I don't want to ramble on too long about this, but it's nice to uh, test out this this um, donation matching idea. Again, this has been a CodeBuddies.org hangout. Uh, with Code Buddies, you can learn to code together. You can ask questions, work through tutorials, share ideas, and pair program on open source projects. So thanks for participating uh, in the Code Buddies community by joining this hangout, and hope to see you around. And uh, maybe you'll host your own hangout or participate in other communities.